Perkar, who's going to present her work on unsupervised machine learning topological phases in an XYZ2 gauge model. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, all right, so for the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna talk about an unsupervised machine learning technique that we hope might be able to give us new insights into all sorts of fun materials, perhaps even superconductors. But to start out, uh, we should probably think about what a good way of modeling these kinds of uh, systems is. And uh, interestingly enough, it starts with unit vectors. So I'd like you to imagine that you are a unit vector and you live in a world in which everything else is also a unit vector. Your world is two-dimensional and you live on a square lattice. So you have four nearest neighbors, uh, one up, down, left, and right, and you have periodic boundary conditions on your system so you actually live on a torus. Okay, and <laughs> great. because we're all adults now and we don't do physics at zero temperature anymore, we're gonna add temperature to our system. And so the parameters of our system are gonna be temperature and n spins, which can either point up or down. And so now we can think about what a good way in which these spins can interact is. And uh, we specify that by specifying this energy term here, um, which is kind of like, so the, the angle brackets represent a sum over nearest neighbors. So you're really doing a dot product of all of the nearest neighbors in your system. So let's think about what happens or how we can minimize the energy of the system. Well, if me and my neighbor both point up, then we can take the dot product and we'll find that our energy is equal to negative j because the dot product is one. But if me and my neighbor are anti-aligned, the dot product is negative one and so we have positive j as our energy. And so the ground state of the system is gonna be one in which all of the spins are aligned, either pointing up or pointing down. So the probabil probability that we see any particular spin configuration is given by something called the Boltzmann factor, which is listed here. And that just tells you, given s and a particular temperature, how likely are we to see this particular s. And you can see that if we have, um, if we have a low energy, it's much more likely that we see that particular state. But if we're at high temperature, uh, higher energy states become possible. And so that's how you can get thermal fluctuations in your system. But what's interesting about this model is that we see spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, where we get a symmetry breaking phase transition. So what does that mean? We can define something called the magnetization, which is uh, listed here, which just quantifies how aligned your spins are. So if all of your spins point up or all of your spins point down, this quantity is gonna be, plus, or it's gonna be equal to one. But if your half your spins point up and half your spins point down, it'll be equal to zero. And so here I've done a numerical simulation of this model with various different lattice sizes shown in different colors. And I plotted temperature on the x-axis and uh, magnetization on the y-axis here. And you can see that at high temperature, the system is disordered, the spins are every which way, but there's a particular temperature that is clearly not equal to zero, where the spins spontaneously align, and this is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, equivalently, there's a peak in the susceptibility, but that doesn't really matter too much. All right, so let's make our model slightly more fancy. Let's, instead of allowing our spins to point up or down, let's let them rotate in the plane. This is called the XY model. And in this model, we don't see a symmetry breaking phase transition, but we do see what's called a topological phase transition. And this is characterized by the proliferation of vortex and anti-vortex pairs. That is, things that literally look like this, uh, little whirlpools in your system. And so what I've done here is I've plotted, again, as a function of temperature, the vorticity of the system in some numerical simulations. And you can see that at low temperature, these vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pairs come together to annihilate each other, and so you get order in, in your system. But at high temperature, they proliferate freely, and so you get a sudden spike in the vorticity at a particular critical temperature. Okay, and uh, this is kind of what they look like in a, in a sample. Okay, so why are these kinds of models actually interesting? Well, sometimes they're kind of directly interesting, like the Ising model, the up-down one, is uh, one for paramagnetism, the XY model has something to do with superconductivity, um, sometimes there are other reasons, like you can take a continuum limit where you set the lattice facing to zero and you can get field theories out, and lots of other reasons. But in general, figuring out the phase diagrams of one of these systems is fairly complicated to do analytically. That is, figuring out if there's a phase in which the system is magnetized, or if there are vortices or no vortices, is somewhat hard to do. And one way of getting around that is using something called Monte Carlo simulations. So this is a technique for using simulations to sample the phase space of a system. So what you do is you start out by initially proposing a random state. So in the case of the 2D XY model, I would specify a bunch of completely random angles for all of the spins to have. And I would declare that I eventually want to get to temperature T. In order to get there, you first compute the state's energy, just using um, your energy formula from before. And then you'll select a random spin and propose a random new angle, or like a spin flip, for this particular site 
So what's the probability that we go from the original state to the one with the new spin flip? That's again given by the Boltzmann factor, but now the E becomes a delta E. And so you can repeat this process where you probabilistically flip or do not flip spins according to the Boltzmann factor, and eventually you'll end up with a statistically independent sample that we say is thermalized at the particular, at the particular temperature T. And then if you repeat this process many, many, many times, eventually you'll end up with a bunch of statistically independent samples. And finally, if you repeat that a bunch of times at different temperatures, you'll be able to sample the entire phase space of the system. Um, but the problem with the Monte Carlo alg algorithm is that it doesn't tell you what quantities to compute. So after you get all these samples, you can do things like compute the magnetization or the susceptibility or whatever you want. And you can observe if there's a peak or some sort of transition that happens. But what if we're missing something? Uh, what if we're not looking at the right quantities? And so this is where the goal of applying unsupervised machine learning comes in. Um, so just very quickly, the difference between supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Uh, in supervised machine learning, you will label samples. So for example, if I was doing the 2DXY model, I would give it a bunch of samples that are in the topological phase, a bunch of samples that are in the non-topological phase, and I would tell it how to classify, basically. Um, but in the case of unsupervised machine learning, you don't give it any labels, you just give it a bunch of data, and you say, do your best to find some sort of structure. Um, and so that's why unsupervised machine learning is a little bit more interesting in this context, because we don't inject any physics into the system. Um, so the particular technique that we use is called a diffusion map, and uh, my project was based on a paper written by my postdoc and another postdoc here, um, in which they used a diffusion map to learn the uh, topological phase transition in the 2D XY model. And that's a kind of canonical model, and so we wanted to see if we could learn something interesting about a slightly more complicated model. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about how the diffusion map works, especially in the context of the 2D XY model, and at the very end, I'll talk about the model that I tried. Okay, so how does a diffusion map work? In general, the goal of a diffusion map is to achieve dimensionality reduction. Uh, this is all of the technical stuff about how it works, but I'm instead going to try to explain it with a picture. Um, so the idea behind dimensionality reduction is that you might have a data set that is in a very high dimensional space. So let's say I'm simulating the 2D XY model on a 10 by 10 lattice. That means we have 100 spins, so we have 100 dimensions per data point. But really all we want to do is classify, is this topological or non-topological? So we want to reduce these 100 dimensions to a, bi to a binary variable. So how can we do that? Uh, well, let's take a simpler example. Let's say we have five data points living in this two dimensional space. We want to be able to use some sort of local similarity metric and eventually be able to get a global similarity out of it. Uh, and so the way that we can do that is by defining some sort of kernel. Uh, this one is called the Gaussian kernel because uh, it looks like a Gaussian, but that's not too important. The only relevant thing is that the only way in which we use the samples is by completing the Euclidean norm here. So this is a metric that is just based on the distance between uh, these two vectors that you're considering. Um, so how do we get from that to global similarity? Um, the idea is to define a diffusion process on your data. Uh, for those of you who don't know physics of diffusion processes, you can kind of think of it like defining a Markov process on your data. Um, for those of you who don't know what Markov processes are, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that you define a transition matrix P that is based on this kernel. Um, and you do this, you basically evaluate the kernel for every single pair of points in your data set. Uh, that gives you a transition probability matrix. And to find out how this distribution will vary in time, you just raise p to the tth power. And if you want to find the sort of stationary or long-term distribution of the system, you take t to infinity. The point is that at any particular time step t, you can define something called the diffusion distance, which looks like this. I realize this form is kind of unintuitive. You can write it in a slightly nicer form. It basically just gives you the probability of going from l to l prime in t steps. Um, but the point is that you can do something nice. Instead of actually having to do this diffusion process, which is very computationally expensive, you can write this matrix in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And from this form, you can show that you actually only need the dominant two or so, two or three eigenvectors uh, in order to fully represent this, or reasonably accurately represent this space. Uh, and so what it amounts to is just plotting the dominant components of your eigenvectors and then doing clustering on that. Okay, so maybe that didn't make a lot of sense, but I'm gonna try to explain how it worked in the context of the 2DXY model. So the first step is to generate a bunch of samples. And the way that we do this um, is using Monte Carlo simulations. There was something I kind of glossed over earlier about the 2DXY model, which is that it has, uh, there's an invariant, which is that if you sort of go around um, any like loop in the torus, the winding number of the system should, be, should remain the same. That is, as you go across, the number of times the spins wind around should always be the same. So this system, for example, is initialized such that all of the rows have a winding number of one, and the columns have a winding number of zero. 
Um, the idea is, that's, is that that's the same aside from when a vortex passes through. And if a vortex passes through, then the winding number will change by the amount that the vortex winds around, which is called the charge of the vortex. Okay, so the next step is to thermalize the samples using the process I described earlier. And so we should find that the winding number is stable in the topologically ordered phase and unstable in the topologically disordered phase. Okay, so next we write out the bare spin arrays. So that is we literally will write out to like a text file the angle of all of the vectors and all of our samples. Um, and we do this a bunch of times. So now we have, in our case, we did it on a 32 by 32 lattice. So we have a, you know, n times 32 by 32 dimensional data set. Then we apply the diffusion map. We get these eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, and at the very end, you can do k-means clustering on the, uh, the eigenvectors or the components of the eigenvectors. And we can tell if we're in the topological or non-topological phase by the failure or the success of this clustering algorithm. Okay. So what does this actually look like? This is um, what the diffusion map will output um, in the case of the 2D XY model at both low and high temperature. So these are the uh, eigenvalues and these are the eigenvectors. Uh, yellow shows one winding number and purple shows a different winding number. And so you can see at low temperature you get beautiful clustering. Um, no samples are uh, incorrectly classified. And you also get this wonderful structure in the eigenvalues. Um, in the case of high temperature, yeah, notice that the scale on this plot is very different from that one. So if you plotted these on that plot, it would just look like a straight line. So there's really no structure going on here. Uh, and so that's how you can do this kind of classification. Um, okay, so the model that I studied over the summer is slightly more interesting. Um, it has both a topological and a symmetry breaking phase transition. Um, it was proposed by a professor at MIT in connection to superconductivity, uh, and it looks something like this. Uh, it looks a little more complicated than before, but it's actually quite similar. So before we had a dot product, right? And that's just a cosine of an angle difference. Here we have a cosine of a half angle difference, so pretty similar. The only other major difference is that we have these sigmas. You can think of the sigmas as kind of like bonds connecting all of the spins. Um, so this model is in three dimensions instead of two dimensions, so each uh, spin will have six sigmas pointing away from it. Um, and the sigmas are allowed to be either plus or minus one. So this value is plus or minus one. And this is a product over plaquettes. So that is, a plaquette is like the smallest possible square you can make in this lattice. Um, so this quantity will get minimized if there's an even number of negative sigmas on every plaquette. What's interesting about this model is that we can do a high temperature expansion, which is very similar to doing like a Taylor expansion. And we can find that um, when we do this, the sigmas, at least to first order, go away. So that's kind of exciting. We should be able to see this, uh, all of the phases of this system just in terms of the spins alone. Uh, and so what are the phases of this system? At least schematically, we know what it should be. Uh, if you set k to zero here, you just get the normal 3D XY model, so that's a nice place to start. You can see at uh, uh, high temperature or low J, you get the space where the vortices are proliferating, and then at uh, high J or low temperature, you get this like magnetized phase. But the interesting thing happens as you increase the value of k. So as you increase the value of k, we find that there's a region in which um, the vortices of odd charge are expelled, but the vortices of even charge are allowed to proliferate, uh, which is like pretty weird. And um, no one's ever been able to directly measure this kind of phase before. And so we were hoping that this would be something that uh, we could do with the machine learning. So unfortunately, it didn't work. <laughs> um, uh, I spent my summer simulating this particular model, both the full model and the expansion. Um, and basically, from our results, we were able to determine that the, uh, the phase transition cannot just be viewed from the spins alone uh, in either the full model or the expansion. Um, and we realized that the reason for this was that the coupling between the sigmas and the spins was just not as strong as we had originally thought, and it was indicated by the expansion. So uh, this is something that we're still looking into, and it was a bit of an unexpected result, but it's still interesting nevertheless. But uh, despite that, we hope that this technique, the diffusion map, will still be of use in other sorts of systems that perhaps have stronger coupling between these two fields. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'd like to thank Subir and Matthias for physics help and uh, all of those people for money. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>